Blessed be the name of the Lord God forevermore, who was and is and is to come. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Galatians chapter 5. We've been talking about the spirit of victory. The spirit of victory. Galatians 5 and verse 5 says, For ye through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Another version puts it this way. For we through the Spirit wait by faith for the hope of righteousness. The hope of righteousness, that which comes out of our union with Christ, that which comes out of Jesus being the vine and we being the branch, and we being the branches, what comes out of that is good fruit. <laughs> what comes out of that is blessings. What comes out of that is the manifested goodness of God. What comes out of righteousness is victory. Amen? What comes out of righteousness is victory. So the hope of righteousness, the expectation, what comes out of it, that hope of righteousness speaks of victory. Say victory. Now, in the same breath, the hope of righteousness, that hope of righteousness being victory, righteousness itself, therefore, is the foundation of victory. Vict victory proceeds from righteousness. So if the foundation is destroyed then we don't have any confidence and hope for victory. Righteousness is the foundation of victory. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 says, Through the offense of one, many were made sinners. Through the offense of one, judgment and death came upon all. But then it also says, much more, they which receive abundance of grace. Let, let me quote that again. For if by one man's offense, death reigned, failure, defeat, and all of that reigned because of that one man. Judgment came because of that one man's offense, Adam. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. They which receive abundance of God's unmerited favor and supernatural ability and enablement shall, um, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life and of the gift of righteousness. The abundance of grace comes as a result of of the gift of righteousness. Now you'll notice there is, it speaks about abundance of grace. If there is abundance of grace, if there's a lot of grace, then there could be a little grace. There could be much grace. There could be, um, like if the tank can be full, then it could be half full. So if there's abundance of grace, then there could be various measures of grace. The Bible speaks about the fact that how he gives more grace to the humble. The Bible speaks about how grace and grace and, 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 and peace is multiplied through knowledge. But when it comes to righteousness, it says the gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness. Are you with me? The gift of righteousness. It's not like it, it, will, it will talk about, about awakening to righteousness. It will talk about becoming established in righteousness. But you're not going to hear about abundance of righteousness and, and a little bit more righteousness. No, it is the gift of righteousness. Are you with me? And the Bible says Jesus was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. It also says in another place that some being ignorant of his righteousness, they go about trying to, trying to create their own, but you don't need to. Amen? Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness. Jesus has come and put an end to people having to go about to develop their own righteousness. He has made it free. It's a gift, and it is the gift of righteousness. And all victory flows out of that gift. In fact, let me uh, turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. Now, we've talked about this before, that righteousness is the foundation. I'm just mentioning it from, with a few different scriptures than we've used before. Amen? 
Hallelujah. Peter says, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I will not be negligent to put you in remembrance. Because by putting you in remembrance of things that you may already know, it can cause you to become established in the truth that you already know. Amen? So Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I now live is the life of Christ. It is Christ that liveth in me. The old man is crucified. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it is Christ that liveth in me. And then it goes on to say, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ died in, died in vain. I do not frustrate the grace of the law. For if righteousness, if this Christ living in me reality could have come about by means of some law, or if it came about by means, if it could come about by means of some law, then Jesus, would not, it wouldn't be necessary for him to die. Him dying would be in vain. So when it says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness, if righteousness, that is referring back to verse 20 when it speaks about Christ in you. When it speaks about the fact that you are crucified with Christ, it's no longer you that live, but it's Christ that liveth in you. Now accept that and do not frustrate the grace of God. For if that that you have obtained in verse 20, that life of Christ in you, if that came by the law, then Christ died in vain. What am I saying? I am saying if righteousness came by the law, and that righteousness is referring directly to the fact that you have been crucified with Christ and the life you now live is the life of Christ. What, what is the point here? The point here is that righteousness is the life of God. It is the life of Christ. Amen? Now, I'm just saying it again from a different perspective. We said it from, we spoke about it from Romans chapter 8 and I believe verse, verse, verse 10, which said um, that your, your spirit is life because of righteousness. We spoke about it from Galatians chapter 3 and verse, verse 21 when he says, if the law, if, if, there was, if, if the law then, or is the law then against the promises of God, God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness would have been by the law. If there was a law given that could give life, if there was a law given that could give life, then righteousness would have come that way. And, and, and instead of saying, then life would have come that way, it says righteousness would have come that way. In other words, this, this issue of the essence of righteousness is life. What life? Zoe life, the life of God. And that is the foundation of your victory. So we got a major in the foundation. Amen? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, um, so it is... It is therefore, since the, the, the foundation is this life of God, it is this union that you have with Christ, it is that Jesus is the vine, you are the branches, is that, it's, is that you've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer you that live, but it's Christ that liveth in you. Therefore, it would mean then that we, in order to have victory, and in order to have a solid foundation, we must walk accurately in the new man. Does that make sense? We must walk accurately in the new man. Philippians 1, 27 talks about that. Um, Galatians, 6 verse, Galatians 6, verse 15 and 16 talks about the same thing. How, how does it put it? If you flip over to Galatians chapter 6, verse, verse 15 puts it this way. It says, um, where am I? Um, it says, for if Christ Jesus, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth, and remember, neither circumcision Avail it, and avail it means provides power. Neither, neither, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avail it anything, nor does uncircumcision, but a new creation. It is a new creation that works. It is a creation, new creation that provides the power. For as, and then it goes on to say, and as many as walk according to this rule, what rule? The rule that is all going to come out of the new creation. 
Everything else, you can forget about it. It is the new creation that avail it. In Galatians 5, verse 6, it says, it, says that, um, it says the same thing in a similar way. It says, for in Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avail it, but faith that worketh by love. When you put that together, when you put Galatians 5, verse 6, and Galatians 5, verse 6, verse 6, sorry, let me, let me back up. I need to slow down here. When you put Galatians 5, verse 6, which says, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision nor, uncirc or, nor uncircumcision availeth, but faith, which worketh by love. It says faith availeth. And then in Galatians 6 and verse 15, it says it's the new creation that availeth. Put that together, it means you got to mix faith in the new creation. That's what availeth. In other words, then, to put faith in the new creation means you got to have faith in the new man. You got to walk uprightly and correctly and accurately in the new man, which is the real you, and that's who you are in Christ. And the essence of the new man is the life of Christ. Amen? And the essence of that is righteousness. This is, this is what it's all about. So it leads us to the conclusion that the spirit of victory is... The spirit of victory there is the spirit of Christ. It's the very essence of Christ. It is the spirit of Christ. The Bible says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Are we all here? All right. Now, we are to, we live in the spirit of Christ. We are to appropriate that correctly. We are to walk and live in righteousness. We are to mix faith with the reality of the, the new man and who we are in Christ. As we mix faith with the new man, as we mix faith with righteousness, as we mix faith with the spirit of Christ, what happens? It produces victory. I'm saying simply this, that righteousness is the foundation. Amen? Hallelujah. But since you must walk in that righteousness, you must walk in that new man, you must walk in that spirit of Christ by faith. Hence, faith becomes a major key. So not only is the spirit of Christ the spirit of victory, but it, it now says, indicates that the spirit of faith is also the spirit of victory. All right? It Bible says again in 1 John 5, 4, Whatsoever is born of God overcome the world. Wonderful, great. But this is the victory that overcome the world, even our faith. The fact that you have all this victory on the inside of here, for it to, for it to, to be made manifest in your life, you've got to have faith and mix faith with who you are on the inside. All right? Are you, are, are you with me in that? All right. Now let's move on. Now, it also says, in, and this is we're now going to go into some little, little, somewhat new area. It also says in Hebrews 6 and verse 12, that through faith and patience, they obtain the promises. Won't you agree that, that, that your victory is not fully manifested until the promises are fulfilled and manifested? So obtaining the promise is the manifestation of your victory. But it says through faith and patience, True faith and remaining in faith. True faith being sustained. So then, yes, faith is the spirit of victory, but faith must be sustained. Faith must be maintained. You've got to be established in it. So that's where we want to focus today. Now, what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna juggle a few definitions here so as to bring some clarity and so as to bring some understanding and so as to open up a door for us to go a little deeper in a particular area and for us to see some things on a very practical level. Amen? I will define sustained faith as continual confidence. Say continual confidence. Say it again. So I will define sustained faith as continual confidence, which is patience. And I'm saying continual Confidence is patience, and I'm going to prove that in a little while. But since faith must be continued, since faith must be sustained, it would mean then that the issue of, 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 of continual confidence and the sustaining of faith is also a part of this victory process, is also a part of that spirit of victory. Amen? Amen? It's like baking a cake. You don't want to leave any of the major ingredients out. Is that right? You need more than just flour. <laughs> you need more than just 
sugar. You need more than just eggs. You may need baking powder. Are you with me? You want to get all the ingredients in there. So yes, righteousness is important. It's absolutely important. You're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to bake no cake if you don't have no flour. It's foundational. But there are other things involved. Faith is important. Who you are, the new man is important. Faith in the new man is important. However, continuing in faith, continual confidence is also a part of it. Now, let's begin to prove this connection. Turn with me to um, Hebrews chapter 10. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. The Bible says you will reap if you what? Faint not. Amen? So we have to, in order to reap, to have victory, we cannot afford to faint. We have to be sustained. We got to continue. Hebrews chapter 10. Say continual confidence. Now, I want to establish this idea and this understanding of continual confidence both of confidence and of continual confidence, and its connection to patience. The emphasis being confidence. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. Would you say great recompense of reward is a victory? Yes. Amen. And then it goes on to say, For you have need of patience, so that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Would you say receiving the promise is victory? Amen. So it says, but cast not away therefore your confidence, which has a great recompense of reward, for you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Can we read into that, that if you were to cast away your confidence, then you would not have that great recompense of reward. You will not be in the place where you will be able to receive the promise. So you cast away your confidence. You may have had confidence, but if you cast it away, no reward, no fulfillment of the promise. Are you with me? But now, what we also see here is cast not away therefore your, your confidence. Sustain your confidence. Don't cast it away. Verse 36, for you have need of patience. In other words, for you to not cast away your confidence is to have patience. So patience is not casting away your confidence. Does that make sense? Just from these verses. Which we can put it, patience is not casting away your confidence. So patience is continuing in your confidence. Patience is sustaining your confidence. Patience is continual confidence. Are you with me? And according to this verse, you've got to have continual confidence in order to have the great recompense of reward, which is victory. In order to, to receive the fulfillment of the promise. So this issue of continual confidence is important. It has everything to do with the manifestation of your victory. Now the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 6, let's just go there and we'll come back over here. Uh, keep keep this, your finger mark at Hebrews chapter 10. We'll come back there. But Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says, That you be not slothful, but be followers of them who through what? Faith and patience. Now we just found out that patience is continual confidence. Is that right? So through faith and continual confidence, what happened? They inherit the promises. So again, we see this issue of inheriting the promise is directly connected not only to faith, but continuing. And this continued confidence, in fact, this whole issue of continuing is directly connected to the issue of being a disciple. Do you know that? The Bible says in, in John chapter 8 and verse uh, 31 and 32, Jesus says, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciple indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Produce your freedom. If you continue in the word, not as if you start, but if you start and you what? Continue, you remain. Say continue in the word. Say continual 
confidence. All right, turn with me to, to John. Eh, yeah, John chapter 15 and verse 7. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Do you like that? Do you like asking what you will and it being done? Would you say that ask what you will and it being done is victory? I would say so. <laughs> that is just like receiving the great recompense of reward. That is just like the promise being fulfilled. But it says, if you abide in me, now if we read before, we know that Jesus was talking, if you abide in me and I in you. If we abide in him and he abides in us. Just like the vine and the branch. He says, if you abide in me, if you abide in me, if you are if you are abiding in me, you're born again, you're living in me, and I'm living in you. But my words is only in you sometimes. It doesn't abide in you. It is there today, tomorrow it's not. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. If you abide in me, that's solid. And I abide in you, that's set. But my words are not abiding in you. You're going to ask what you will. And what will happen? What will happen? It will not be done. Does that make sense? Even though you abide in him and him abiding in you, if the word is not abiding in you. Now, when you hear the word abiding, the word abiding, don't you get the sense of um, present, continuous? It's here now and it's going to be there tomorrow. It's going to be there next week. And he says, if you abide in me and my words are abiding in you, what's the result? You shall ask what you will and it shall be done. And that's called victory. So what am I saying? And this issue of abiding, this continuing. And the very essence of the word abiding in you and believing that word and cleaving onto it, in it itself is also connected up to confidence. So again, we see that connection. Now let's look at another one. Let's turn, turn me to James. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And reading from verse 2. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing. Say knowing. Look up here. Say knowing. Say it one more time. Say it loud. No. All right. We're going to take knowing and we're going to hang it over here. All right? Okay? So if I reach over here, is what, what am I going for? No. Knowing. So we're going to leave knowing here for a while because we're going to come back to it. Say knowing. No. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> come to the Lord Joe when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing. Knowing what? That the trying of your faith Knowing that not only that it is your faith that is on trial, don't take it personally. <laughs> knowing that it is your faith on trial, but not just knowing that. Knowing that that trying or that testing or that proving of your faith worketh patience. It produces patience. It produces this continual confidence. It has the potential of producing patience. A continual confidence. And it says, so let patience, let that continual confidence, let that force have its perfect work. In other words, let it continue to operate. Let that, let that state of being continually confident, that state of perseverance, that state of, and mindset of patience, let it continue to remain, be established in it. Let it continue to work. And what will happen? You will be what? That you may be made what? Perfect. That means mature. And what? Entire. Complete. What does it say? Wanting. Does wanting nothing sound like victory? But what did it take? It takes staying in faith. It takes continuing. All right. Let's go to two more verses of scripture. I, I think we're beginning to establish this, are, are we? All right, let's go to Luke chapter 21. 
Luke chapter 21. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The message today is actually called the Spirit of Victory is Continual Confidence. Amen? Hallelujah. We want to bake this cake right. <laughs> Luke 21 verse 19. Beautiful verse. In your patience possess ye your souls. In your patience possess ye your souls. The, Bab the Amplified says, by your steadfastness and patience endurance, you shall win the true life of your souls. I like that. All right? <laughs> by your steadfastness and patient endurance, you shall, King James says, possess your soul. Amplified says, win the true life of your souls. The true life of your souls. Now, here you are. You are born again. Your spirit is life because of righteousness. You have the life of Christ and the spirit of Christ on the inside of you, in your spirit man, in, 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 the, in, in, in the new man, in the hidden man of the whole earth, in the in, in man of the heart. Now you want that life, that Zoe life that is in you to flow out and to be over and to overtake your soul, don't you? Don't you want the life of God in your emotions? You know what it is if you can have the life of God manifested in your emotions? Man, you'll be one happy camper. <laughs> you'll be full of joy and speakable and full of glory. You would have peace like a river. Amen? You would have a mind that is so clear, no confusion. You would have a will so yielded to God, it would be your doing his will, doing his will and his word would be your meat and your sustenance. So this here says, and to get to that point where the life of God, where you can win the true life of your souls, where you can have this life of God in your soul, where you can possess your soul, it says patience, continual perseverance, continual confidence is a key. Now, what does it mean to be able to possess your soul. Do you know that if you could possess your soul and your soul could be underneath the dominion of the word of God and the spirit of God and your own born again spirit, do you know that leaves no access to the devil? Do you know that's total victory? Do you know that? In fact, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10. You see, you normally win or lose the battle in your mind. You normally win or lose the battle with your emotions. You normally will win or lose the battle with, with, in terms of what you do with your will. You can win and lose the battle if, your, if memories that are rooted in failure and rooted in the old man and rooted in darkness, if those memories overtake you, you can lose the battle. And the battle is the Lord's, which means what? You've got to fight the battle His way. Amen? Amen? If he says, put, send the trumpeters before, that's what you got to do. You got to do it his way. The battle is the Lord's. And if you do not, if you, if, if, if you allow the soul to not be under the dominion of the word of God and the spirit of God, that's a pathway of defeat. That is the broad way that leads to destruction. But the narrow way that leads to life is when you can have the word of God, when you can receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul, when you can get the word of God engrafted and you can get your mind and your will and your thoughts and your emotions to all line up and be subject to the word of God and be underneath the government of the Holy Ghost. We've got victory, total victory, which connects up victory with what's happening in your soul. So be, to be able to possess your soul by patience uh, so that you can have the true life of God manifested in your soul is a big deal, isn't it? Because that's where we live and that's the area that the enemy attacks. That is, in fact, if you want to put, if you want to look, put it, look at it this way, that is the area, that is one of the strongholds that the enemy trusts in. He tries to make that his stronghold. And if we can take that away from him, and he doesn't have that access, guess what? We'll be able to spoil him. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about Luke chapter 11 and verse, um, verse 22. You don't have to go there, but I'm talking about Luke 11 verse 22, which says, 
when a, um, that when a strong man arm keep it his place, his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come, that's us, shall come upon him and overcome him, we are overcomers, and take it from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoil. Part of the armor that the devil trusts in is if he can control your soul. And here we have a scripture that says, through patience, we can come to the place of being entire and wanting nothing. Through this power of continual confidence, we can possess our soul and take it out of the devil's dominion. Whoo, glory to God. Can you imagine when the devil cannot manipulate your emotions, when he cannot manipulate your mind, when you can bring every thought and capture it and bring it and make it subject to Christ and obedient to the word of God? What access does he have? Amen? And that is the battle. That's where the battle is. I know there was a, a minister several years ago who wrote a book called The Battle of the Mind. And I believe she got it right, at least in the title she did. Right? I don't know all the essence of the book, so I'm not judging the book, but I'm telling you it's a good title. There's a lot of truth in that title. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, this whole thing. Hebrews chapter 10, we were reading how in verse 35 and verse 36, don't cast away your confidence, therefore. Don't cast it away because it has a great recompense of reward. You have need of continual confidence and patience so after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. And then it says, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and, and will not tarry. But now the just shall live by faith. While you may not have the manifestation, you walk by faith and not by sight. And you do not draw back. No, you maintain your confidence. My soul, God says, will have no pleasure in him, in the one that draws back. But guess what? We are not of them who draw back. Why? We continue in confidence. We continue in faith. We remain steadfast. We are not of them who draw back onto perdition, but of them that what? Continue. But instead of saying unto them that, but we are of them that continue, it says, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Do you see that? In other words then, this faith walk is not, doesn't arrive until we got the soul under control. Do you get that? That is the end point. But to get to that end point, because that end point is total victory. Once the soul is in line, you've got complete, total victory and the devil has no access. So that's the end point of your faith. So when the Bible says, for instance, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, the fight that you are in is to stay in faith until what? You possess your soul. Until you get to the end point. Flip with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Sometimes, you know, we want to know, when do we arrive? What do we have to do in order to have the manifestation, in order to have the victory sure? If we get to this point of the possessing of the soul, the manifestation will be there. Because that's the end point. Thank God for faith, but it's faith and patience you obtain the promises. Thank God for confidence, but you can't cast it away. Thank God for, be, for abiding in him and him in us. But the word got to also abide and remain in you. Then you can ask what you will and it shall be done. First Peter chapter 1, I, I, I'm headed to verse 9, but let's read verse 8. Whom, talking about Jesus, having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing. What do you do? You rejoice. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Your faith where Jesus is concerned is so solid, so strong, that even though you don't see him, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And even in the tough times, you were able to do that. Rejoice that the, of, of, about regarding his reality in your life. And then it goes on to say, receiving the end of your faith. What is the end of your faith? The salvation of your soul. When the soul is underneath the dominion of the word of God and the spirit of God. When your soul is in subjection to your spirit. Are you with me? Hebrews chapter 5, let's flip over there since we are on it. Hebrews chapter 5, verse, verse 14, says, Strong meat belong to them 
that are full age, them that are mature, who? Those that by reason of use, by reason of use and exercise, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Those who have been walking in this stuff with such continual confidence and persistence that their mind, will, and emotions and their senses come to the place where they bow and they are able to recognize this is good. And they can choose what is right. Think about that. Can you imagine that same flesh? Those same instruments that used to be instruments of unrighteousness all of a sudden have come to the place where all they want to do is glorify God. When, they can, when their senses can say, can bow to him. When your senses, when, you're, when your physical eyes is seeing something different to what the word of God say, but your physical eyes submit to the word of God. And that even though it looks that way, your physical eyes submit to what your spirit is saying, what your sixth sense is saying. That's a place of maturity, isn't it? All right? So what is the point? That's the end of your faith. But how do you get there? The issue is continued, continual confidence. Amen? Have we made a connection? All right, let's continue. So my question would be, how then do we, if we're going to talk about continual confidence, then I think we need to talk about confidence. <laughs> Amen? I want to know how I can have, how I can develop this confidence, and then how do I stay in it? So let's talk about that. How do we develop this confidence that leads to continual confidence and patience and perseverance? How? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, let me make a little, a little tweak. Let me tweak something here a little bit. Can I do that? Many times when we talk about patience and perseverance, our understanding tells us that we, you know, we tend to think of patience and perseverance and steadfastness as holding fast, as staying in faith, not giving up, being steadfast, not quitting, and that's important. And we tend to have that concept of it, and I think that's okay. But confidence to me has something Slightly more than patience, at least in my understanding. It, 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 to me, it is like reinforced concrete. You know what concrete is? Is concrete pretty solid? Is concrete is pretty solid. But when they put some steel bars on the inside of that concrete, it increases its strength. So to me, confidence is like, is, is, is like your patience reinforced with steel. Quite frankly, we're talking about the steel of joy, but we're going to go there later. Right? Because you need something to help you when you get weary. And joy is the key. In other words, patience being reinforced. Confidence is like a reinforced kind of patience. You follow me? It's, 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 it's solid. It's strong. In fact, it is so strong that confidence is actually connected up with knowing. Say knowing. Now, uh, for the sake of time, let me just quote this scripture. For instance, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. That we are confident, knowing, knowing what? That when we are absent from the body, that, 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 that being in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and we walk by faith, not by sight. Second Corinthians 5, 6 says, we are confident, knowing. We are confident, what? Knowing. So there is a knowing that goes with confidence. There is a knowing that is connected up with confidence. Now, where are we heading? We're trying to understand how can we develop confidence. Knowing is a key. Knowing is a key. James 1, I remember that over here. Did you guys remember this here? Let's get it back. James 1, verse 2. The trial, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. What? Knowing. In other words, to come to joy in the midst of all these tests and trials and hardships, you can't do that from a natural standpoint. But when you know, when you know, when you know certain things, you can. Confidence knows. Confidence knows. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says um, in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12. He says, for... For the which cause, he says, nevertheless, he says, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded 
that he is able to keep that which have committed unto him against that day. And I think you referred to that verse earlier. I know in whom I have believed. There is that knowing. Say, I know. I know in whom I have believed. But it, it adds something else. And I am persuaded. That's part of it. That's part of this confidence. It's knowing and it's being fully persuaded. And I am persuaded that he is able. Being fully persuaded. The Bible says in um, Romans chapter 4. Now turn over there so that you can see that. Romans chapter 4. Remember Abraham? Can you imagine here is Abraham, 100 years old, his wife is 90 years old, and, and they have been told that they're going to have a child. And they got to believe that. Amen? And everybody else are thinking, yeah, a child, sure. <laughs> but the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 4 and verse 19, And being not weak in faith, he considered not... His own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither did he consider the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now here's a phrase. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. In other words, some or the other, unbelief was null and void. Unbelief and doubt was null and void. He staggered not. He was not double-minded. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded, being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform it. What's my point? Confidence has to do with knowing. It has to do with being fully persuaded. And let me add a third thing. It has to do with being free and victorious over doubt and unbelief. Say doubt and unbelief. Here's another illustration of the issue of doubt and unbelief. In other words, to get to this place of confidence, we got to know. We got to be fully persuaded. And we've got to deal with the doubt and unbelief. Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe. That those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. In other words, Jesus says, you got to, um, and doubt not in his heart, but shall believe. Doubt not, but believe. Doubt not, but believe. This issue of doubting not and believing is what confidence is all about. Amen? So, the question is, how do we get there? How do we get rid of that doubt, get rid of that unbelief, come to that place of being fully persuaded, come to that place of knowing? I believe that the number one, is, obviously the word of God is always the answer to everything. Do you, have you ever noticed that? You ever noticed that no matter what you study, <laughs> no matter what the subject is, at the end of the day, the word is the source and the word is the answer. The Bible says in Mark chapter 6, Jesus came into his hometown. And of course, there, there were miracles happening everywhere. But when he came into his hometown, he could dare do no mighty work because there were, the people were thinking, wait a minute, we know him. We know his sisters. We know his mother. He grew up with us. Where did he get off? Like, how, come all, how come all these miracles that we're hearing about, are, 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 he's operating in them? And they were offended. They stumbled over that fact that this is somebody that we grew up with operating like this. And they just couldn't handle it. And the Bible says in verse 5 um, that Jesus could there do no mighty work save he laid his hands upon a few folks, a few six folk, and he healed them. It didn't say that Jesus would not do any mighty miracles. It says he could not. And then verse 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Abraham was fully persuaded. He got over the unbelief, and he, was, he wasn't staggering at the promise of God. But these people were staggering. Amen. They were drunk with unbelief. And Jesus marveled. He marveled because of their unbelief. And what did he do? Leave town? No. He went around about the villages teaching. In other words, his way of overcoming that unbelief is teaching. When we get into this healing stuff, there is going to be a lot of teaching. Because there are several reasons, there are several obstacles that, that people have to deal with when it comes to healing. Some of them think it's passed away. Some of them, because of a bad experience they've had in the past, they think, yeah, God might heal. But, but they don't believe healing is for me. And then some believe that God heals some people, but not everybody. 
right? Some, some believe that God want to teach them something from the sickness and disease. Some of them believe in healing, believe it's present, believe it's, it's for today. They don't believe it's passed away, but they don't know how to receive it. Amen? Well, what would Jesus do? Jesus went about teaching. To what? To, to correct, to bring the correction. So as to bring about the knowing. So as to bring about the understanding. The Bible says my people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. It also says in, James, in, um, in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 13, that if my people are led into captivity because of lack of knowledge. It says in, in, in Ephesians 4 and verse 18, that they are alienated from the life and the power of God. Why? Because of the ignorance of their heart. That's lack of knowledge. So, so this knowledge thing is important. Understanding is important. And Jesus used the method of teaching to remedy, to remedy that, to bring about that understanding. So I believe it's the same thing as to how are we going to get to that level of confidence? How are we going to get to that place of knowing? Well, there's a couple of things we need to know. I'm just going to mention some of them. We're not going to get into them deeply at this time. However, I'll mention about five areas of things where we have to know. Number one, we must know the will of God. We have to know the will of God. It says in 1 John 5 and um, 1 Epistle of John, chapter 5 and verse 14 and 15, that this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Does that sound like victory? We know that we have the petitions we desire of him. But where did it start? This is the confidence that we have in him. That we know that th this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So we need to know his will. We need to know the will of God. And then when you need to know the will of God and all of these things that I'm going to talk about that you need to know, you need to know them and they got to be, they got to become true to you. You've got to be immersed in them. That's number one. Number two, it is very important that the very area of struggle that you need to know that you already have the victory. The area, if it's healing, you need to know that the healing has already been accomplished. You need to know that whatever you're dealing with, provisions has been made concerning that issue in the redemptive work of Christ. Put it this way, you need to know that it's already done. You need to know that it's already done. It's already accomplished. Jesus says in John 16, 33, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. But you can be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. What does that mean? He's saying that whatever problem you're facing, I have already faced it. I have overcome it. I am victorious over it. And that victory, I'm giving it to you. It's already, you've all, the, the, uh, the, that victory has already been won by Christ and it belongs to you. Amen? Now, if it's, now, 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 of course, we need to be specific and we need to have specific promises and have specific understanding concerning the matter that we're dealing with and see that it's already done. Because when you see that it's already done, then it means you don't have to persuade God to do it. It means you don't have to beg and plead. It would not be a, it's not a matter of persuading God or begging and pleading. It would be a matter of you receiving. Amen? And it's kind of hard to doubt that God is going to do what he's already done. Isn't that right? Are you with me? That's a good place to be. So, again, knowing, understanding, understanding redemption, understanding what has been accomplished, understanding that the inheritance, Colossians 1 verse 12 to 14, says a couple of things. Number one, it says that you are qualified because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for all of the inheritance. Which means you've got a right to all of the promises. It's already yours. It goes on to say you've been delivered from the devil's dominion, from the devil's kingdom, and you're now in the kingdom of Christ. And then it says further that in Christ you have redemption, you have forgiveness of sins, it's already yours. So when you understand what comes with your redemption package and that it's already done, then you can come into a place of confidence because, you could come because of knowing. Say knowing. All right, I want you to see another verse of scripture. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 14. And verse 26. So what we need to know, we need to know the will of God. What else we need to know? We need to know that it's already done and have a deeper understanding of, rev of redemption. 
Now we're going to find number three, four, and five right here. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 26. Are you there? It says, in the fear of the Lord is what? Strong confidence. I like that. Do you like that? Is what kind of confidence? Strong confidence. Therefore, if you want strong confidence, I would think you ought to major in the fear of the Lord. Wouldn't you say? So, what do we get from that? Now, um, okay, we got to major and we got to get a hold of the fear of the Lord. Flip with me to Psalms 25. Say the fear of the Lord. All right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Psalms 25 and verse 14 gives us a nice little clue. It says in verse 14, Blessed be the name of the Lord. The secret of the Lord is with who? With them that fear him. And he will show who? Them. His covenant. He's going to show them that fear him his covenant. In other words then, part of the fear of the Lord, when you fear the Lord, God will reveal his covenant to you. But you see, in the very essence of the covenant is where God swears that what I said I'm going to do, I'm going to do, even if it costs me my own life. What God swears to in covenant, he backs up by his own life. In other words, God is saying, it is easier for me to cease to exist than for me to not, perf than for me to not perform what I have promised. That's the power of covenant. And that is the reason why in Genesis chapter 15, when God told Abraham, he said, look here, you see all this land here? I'm going to give you all of this land. And Abraham is probably thinking, there are people living here. Can you imagine God said, I'm going to give you all of, 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 of Burlington, um, North York, Toronto. I'm going to give it all to you. And it's going to all belong to you. You know what I mean? Your brain is like, okay, what do you mean you're going to give it to me? Like, people are living there. What are you going to do with them? So it kind of like boggled Abraham's mind. And Abraham said, God, how can I know this? In other words, you, you know, I, 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 I hear you saying this to me, but you got to help me, man. I'm, I'm having all kinds of problems here trying to believe this. Help me. How can I know this? And God says, go get me a heifer. Go get me a, a um, and, and God tell him, go get these animals to do what? Sacrifice. What was God saying? God was saying to Abraham, you go, bring these animals, let's make a sacrifice, and we're going to cut a covenant. And for Abraham, God cutting a covenant with him was what it took for him to know that what God said is indeed so, that God was going to give him this land. You follow me? What am I saying? I am saying the power of the covenant. When you know the power of the covenant covers your case, then you also know that God is swearing by himself and it is impossible for him to lie. Are you with me? So sometimes, and that's one of the things when we, when we talk and study about healing, that's one of the things we're going to take a lot of time on is to see it in the covenant. It's to see it in the finished work of Christ. See it where the blood is concerned. So as we talk about covenant, the strength of the covenant leads us to the power of the blood. Because the power of the blood, the blood is, in a, in, is the life of the covenant. The, it is, the blood is the, sim, is the symbol of, of, of the covenant and, 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 and God swearing and so on. The blood, the, the, the blood is your connection with him. The Bible says God sprinkled, Abraham sprinkled the people with the blood. I believe that by faith we have been sprinkled by the blood of Christ when you were born again. That all the words of this book and the people were sprinkled by the blood. What, in other words, there's a covenant that these words belong to you. Glory to God. And God says, I'm backing it up. So when you get a hold of the power of the blood and the power of the covenant, it can bring you into a place of confidence, into a place of knowing. Now, in all of these things, it takes diligence. Remember, back in, back in um, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12, when it says, it says, be followers of them who through faith and patience obtain the promise, the verse actually says, do not be slothful. 
but be diligent and to be followers of them. In other words, it does take diligence to apply some of these things in our lives. Amen? But bless God, the reward is victory. Hallelujah. So number three, I would say the power of the blood and the strength of the covenant. Number four, the authority of God's word. You need to know the authority of God's word. The Bible says in Psalms 119, and, and that's connected to the fear of the Lord. Because it's in, the, in the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. And part of the fear of the Lord is when you have this deep reverence, this reverential fear, and, and um, where God's word is concerned. Psalms 119, verse 161. Um, puts it beautifully and says, my heart stands in awe of thy word. In another place, it says, it is impossible for God to lie. When you can, and, 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 and the God says, I will not alter the words that, that came out of my mouth concerning the covenant. In, in um, Psalms 89 verse 34. So, the, connected up with the fear of the Lord that produces a strong confidence, part of the fear of the Lord is to reverence God, reverence His Word, magnify His Word above all else, where what His Word says is far more important and you hold it in higher esteem than the words, of, than the words or opinions of anyone else, including yourself. Amen? You have got to get to a place where what God says is what matters, where your own opinion is not as important. Let God be true and every man, including me, be a liar. Amen? All right. Number, number, that was number four. Number five, knowing God's character. Knowing God's character. Turn me to Jeremiah chapter 33. You say, what does the fair Lord have to do with God's character? A lot. A lot. Jeremiah chapter 33. Now, when God revealed himself to Abraham, he hid himself in the cleft of the rock, and he says, I'm going to reveal my name, and he says, I'm going to let all my goodness pass before you. Amen? He says, I'll show you my glory, and he says, I'll let all the essence of my being, I'll show you my glory, I'll show you the essence of who I am. And he hid he hide, um, Abraham in the cleft of the rock, and he said, I'm going to let all my goodness pass before you. In other words, the essence and the, of God is that he is exceedingly good. We can talk about many things. We can talk about his holiness. We can talk about his faithfulness. We can talk about his, his fruitfulness, his perfection and judgment and so on and his love. But God is good. It is amazing how many times the Bible mentions that God is good. And the fear of the Lord is to respect and honor God for who he is. And part of the very essence of his being is the fact that he is so good. Hallelujah. Now, you know when it says back in, uh, uh, you can look, look at Jeremiah 33. But back in um, Philippians when it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Many times one can have the idea of fear and trembling as, as some, from a judgmental standpoint. But in actual fact, that's not what it is at all. The Bible speaks in, in, um, in Mark, I think it's, the Bible speaks in Mark chapter 5, verse 33. You don't need to turn there. But a woman with the issue of blood, remember that? After she got her healing and Jesus turned around to find out, well, who touched me? The Bible says the woman in fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. That fear and trembling had to do with standing in such great awe of his marvelous goodness. Can, there was no one else could help her, but man, it, uh, but she stood in such awe of his great goodness. And that's what it was referring to by that fearing and trembling. Here in Jeremiah 33 and verse 9, it says, And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them, and they shall fear and tremble. Why? They shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. God wants you to be so prosperous. God wants you to be so blessed. God wants your life to manifest his goodness and his abundance in such an excessive way that when people see you and they recognize that it is God that has done it in your life, they would have a fear and a trembling and they would stand in awe that your God would do this for you. He is such a good God. 
Study this out. Study this out. Hosea chapter 3 verse 5 refers to the same thing. Psalms 31 verse 19. Let me flip over to that one. That one. Um, let me flip to that one. Psalms 31 verse 19 says, Oh, how great is thy goodness, which you have laid up for who? For them that fear you. For them that fear you. How great is your goodness. So part of the fear of the Lord is to recognize God's great goodness. That's why I said they that come to God must believe that he what? That, he's, that he is. And that he's a what? Rewarder. That means what? He is good. You learn to recognize God's great goodness and you will be in a place of faith. Why? Because that's the very essence of his being. That's part of his love nature. And the Bible says faith is empowered and energized by what? Love. Faith work it by love. So what is the point? Knowing the way you develop this confidence is you got to know. Know what? You got to know the will of God. You got to know that it's already done and understand that it's in the redemption. You need to develop in the fear of the Lord and have and, and know the strength of his covenant and the power of the blood. You need to know the authority of God's word, that God is not a man that he should lie. You need to know his character, that he has integrity, that he is faithful, and above all else, to know that he is exceedingly good beyond measure. Hallelujah. And the Bible says in Daniel 11, 32, they that know their God shall be what? Strong and do what? Great exploits. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Second Peter chapter 1. Hallelujah. And we're going to begin to close here. Continual confidence. But you got to have confidence before it could become continuous. Amen. Now, I think this is such a wonderful verse. Second Peter chapter 1 verse, verse 12. Peter says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of those Things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. He says, I will, Peter says, I'm going to put you in remembrance. I'm going to put you in remembrance, even though you already know it. Even though you've already heard it. I'm going to tell you what you already heard last week. I'm going to tell you what I already told you the last time I was, I was by here. Why? He says, I'm not going to be negligent. He says, as long as I'm, I, as I'm in this body, I'm going to keep telling you. Why? So that you could become established. In the truth. Now, you see, here's what happened. We can have a spirit of, of, of familiarity, the same familiarity that, that those people that Jesus' home tongue had with him. We know who he is, you know. So, as a result of that, they, they were in unbelief and they couldn't receive, they couldn't operate in faith for the miracles to take place. So, we can have a familiarity sometimes. Well, I know who he is. Oh, that's past. He's going to just preach the same thing again. But you see, that, the Bible says that kind of stuff produces and it opens up the door for unbelief. Why? There is an irreverence and a disrespect and a lack of the fear of the Lord and reverence for the word of God. And as a result, the word of God will not prosper. So, um, we need to get to a place of reverence for the word of God. Which means that when we hear it, we need to hear it again and again and again. Because faith coming by what? Hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. But you see when someone says, oh, I heard that. Tell me something else. What are they saying? They are really, whether they realize it or not, they are really just giving the evidence that all they have done is mentally ascended to what they heard. And that I heard that. I, I'm familiar with that. I know what that says. Right? And they just mentally, mentally, intellectually, I've heard that. But you see, has your heart heard it? The word needs to get into your heart. Where you, there's a hearing of the heart. And that hearing of the heart goes beyond the intellect. That comes from hearing and hearing and hearing. That is the whole process about meditation. When you're meditating on the word again and again and again, by his stripes I'm healed. By his stripes I'm healed. He bore my sickness. He carried my infirmities. By his stripes I'm healed. By Jesus' stripes I were healed. If I were healed, then I am healed. The same spirit raised up Christ from the dead. He dwells in me. He quickens my mortal body. He quickens every joint. By the same spirit that raised up Christ. And you go over and over 
intellectually, nothing is changing. But what's happening? It gets into your heart. And that meditating process will move you from just mentally ascending to having real heart faith. You follow me? So Peter says, as long as I'm here, I'm going to keep reminding you. So here is the thing. These five areas of knowing the will of God, it's already done. The power of the blood and the, and the power of the covenant, the authority of God's word, God's character. You, these very things, you got to go back and keep hearing and hearing and hearing. You got to go back and meditate on it. Yes, it's good to recap from last week. It is important. Amen? Because that is how it works. That's why Psalms 1 says that when a man meditates on the word and he delights in it, he becomes like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Jeremiah chapter 17 speaks about him being like a palm tree, which means what? Deep roots instead of a shrub. A shrub gets knocked over in the midst of a storm. But I'm telling you, that palm tree might wave, but it's going to survive because of the deep roots. How do those deep roots come? By meditating, by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen? Now, I'm going to give you a nice uh, something that you can take home and that you can work with easily. And I could do this in two minutes. How many of you, the Bible says in, in Romans chapter, I'm going to give you a four-step formula. How do you like that? One, two, three, four. But very quickly. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. It has the power to produce wholeness. It has the power to produce prosperity. It has the power to produce promotion. It has the power to produce jobs. It has power to produce healing. It has power to produce divine protection. It has power to produce um, order within the family. It has power to bring deliverance. It has power to bring mental soundness. It has power to drive out confusion. It has power to bring wholeness. The gospel is the power of God. Well, say, don't you want that power to work? Because that power working is victory. Now, here is a way how you get that power to work. Number one, how shall they hear without a preacher? Because faith cometh by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. How shall they preach except they be sent? So first of all, you got to hear. So step number one is you got to hear. Here by the meditating on the word, here by the preaching of the word, because God has ordained to manifest himself and to manifest faith through preaching. So number one, you got to hear. Number two, you got to believe. You got to believe, and that belief comes from hearing, because it's, the gospel is the power of God, all the salvation to who? To them that believe. With a heart, man, believe it. So you must believe. And believing is not automatic. That's why it takes hearing and hearing. The Bible says that you got to labor to enter into that rest of believing. Hebrews 4 verse 11. It's not as well I choose to believe. I wish it was that easy. We would all be raising the dead. <laughs> Amen? But you got to meditate on the word. You got to pay the price to believe. But, and then number three, you got to develop this continued confidence. Because like Jesus said, you got to believe and doubt not. And that is having a continued confidence. And we talked about some of those ways to develop in that confidence. And then number four, you speak to your mountain. But now you see, to speak to your mountain for it to produce, you need to be speaking from a heart that has heard. You got to speak from a heart that believes. And you got to have a, be speaking from a heart that has confidence. The Bible says in, in, in Job 22 and verse 28, You shall decree a thing, and it shall be established unto you, and it will cause light to shine upon your pathways. You shall decree a thing and it shall be established. That's great. That's victory. But before you get to verse 28, back into verse 21, it says in, in, in Job 22 verse 21, Acquaint now thyself with God and be at peace. It is because of that acquainting with God. It is because of knowing him. It is because of coming to that place of knowing that you could eventually get to the place where you have the power to decree. In other words, that decreeing needs to come from a heart of confidence, a heart that knows God. They that know their God will be strong and do great exploits. But where does that knowing come from? That knowing is the confidence we're talking about. So yes, you got to hear. Yes, you must believe. But you also have to develop this heart of confidence. And then from there you speak. Now, does, that, does that mean you can't declare and decree before you develop confidence? No, it doesn't mean that. But it just means the mountain might not move right away. 
But you keep, start, keep talking because the mountain might not move, but your heart is hearing. And now your faith level is rising. And next thing you know, you do get to the confident level. And then when you speak to the mountain, pew, boom, mountain is gone. Hallelujah. You believe that? That's how it is. Glory to God. Continued confidence. Say it. Continued confidence. Say it again. Continued confidence. Say it again. Continued confidence. Say knowing. 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 I know in whom I have believed. I know what he has said. I know his character. I know his great goodness. I know the authority of the blood. I know who I am. I know the devil is defeated. I know Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Amen.